I want to go back a little bit uh, this morning, uh, we're calling the, the sermon today the blessing because the blessing will be given to, to Joseph's sons. But I want us to go back a little bit when, for a few moments when Jacob was young because we need to understand what the blessing is about. What, what are we talking about as we're talking about a blessing at this point in Jacob's life as he's dying? When Jacob was young and he was running for his life, the Lord approached or appeared to him and made some promises to him. So these are the promises that God made to Jacob when he was young. He said, the land on which you lie, he was in Canaan, the land on which you lie I will give to you and your offspring. He said, and your descendants shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and the east, the north and the south. And he said, all the families will be blessed in you and your descendants. And then he says, no, God says to Jacob, he says, know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you alone until I have done what I promised you. So when Israel now, who is Jacob, now remember we'll use the term back and forth, it, uh, I'll use the, the name because his name was changed to Israel. When Israel or Jacob prepared to go down to live in Egypt, the Lord appeared to him again. So he's appeared to him when he was younger, and now he's going down to save their lives. They have no food. Jake, or Joseph is in, in uh, Egypt, and, and he has got control of all the, all the food, basically, of that entire part of the world. And so they're going down to live in Egypt where his son Joseph is. And here's what the Lord said to him as he was about to go down there. Because remember, he's leaving the land that God has promised to him, and he's going to be moving to Egypt. He said, God told him, he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation, a great nation there. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again, and Joseph's own hand shall close your eyes. So Jacob or Israel has lived with God's promise all of his life. And now the, the Lord was with Jacob when he ran for his life. And once again, God promised to go with Jacob into Egypt and not only go with him to Egypt, then bring him back to the land that he's promised him. He's not giving up the land, even though he has to move at this point. He's not having to give up the land that God has promised to him. So I want us to continue the story that Chad's been sharing with us for the past, past several weeks. And uh, so when, a when Israel or, or Jacob went down to, I to Egypt, he was finally united, reunited with his favorite son, Joseph. They wept together and Israel uh, told Joseph, he said, well, now I can die because I've seen for myself that you're alive. And I can't even imagine how awesome it would be to if you thought your child was dead for that long to find out your child was still alive and get to see and hug and hold your your um, your child. I think that'd be awesome. And so the, the Lord worked through Joseph's relationship with Pharaoh to provide the best land in Egypt for Jacob's family so they could graze their flocks. Now I want you to remember that they get this best land. That's the upside. Now the other side is, is that they are sheep herders. And so in Egypt, sheep herders are seen as lower level, lower class of people. So so they get the best land, but they're still seen as, as people who are, are a little bit lower class than the Egyptians. Um, and so maybe it was because they didn't know how to walk like an Egyptian. No, never mind. Some of you aren't old enough for that, are you? So the Lord worked with Joseph's relationship, and, and so they have this great land. And now this, this promise starts coming about. They're going to be as numerous as the, as the dust of the earth. And, and uh, so when Joseph presented his father to Pharaoh, so Joseph's dad actually gets to meet Pharaoh. Remember, he's a, he's a sheep herder. Uh, that's who Jacob is. And, but yet he gets to meet the Pharaoh. And, and it really, it was a meeting of the, the Lord of Egypt, if you will, and then the father of promise. And so I'm sure that the Pharaoh who embodied this secure, royal, uh, probably condescending uh, actual, actually uh, ad, ad, attitude 
he, he's facing Jacob who in, embodies, it, it, being the Lord of the uh, land, person of promise, he embodies what's precarious, what's unstable, unstable and, and, and even uh, maybe supplicating. And so, so Jacob has, has the better part, I really think, because Israel blesses Pharaoh. And so, so I want us to remember, I think it's a good time for us to, to talk for just a second about the fact that the verbal blessing that was passed down, remember they didn't write a lot in those days. And so the, the verbal blessing, the blessing that's passed down from that God is blessed and then you pass that blessing on, that was a huge part of their tradition and it set the stage for, it set the life of, the parameters of the life for the person who was blessed. So remember that. So, so Israel blesses the Pharaoh, but then he also will bless Joseph's sons. So we get to chapter 47. We're going to look at 48 in just a minute. But when we get to chapter 47, it tells us about Joseph's business dealings. I'm going to talk about that for a minute. Because Joseph became an extremely shrewd businessman. He became a guy that, that he had entered the world of the empire, if you will, and had become an extremely shrewd businessman. I invite you to go back and read chapter 47 sometime. It, it, it really talks a lot about it. The Egyptian empire offered food and, and with the food, life. Uh, and, and, but, but they were never too far from also exploitation oppression, and even slavery. They were just right there that close to it all the time. And so what would happen, what was happening under, even under Joseph, is that there, in exchange for food, Joseph collected money. Which is fine, we do that all the time, right? But then, when they ran out of money, then Joseph says, okay, I'll give you food for your livestock. Now your livestock is what you would use to make money with. So not only do you not have money, but now you're losing your ability to make money because you're giving up your livestock for, for the food. And so Joseph collected money. Then he collected the livestock. But then when they ran out of livestock, then the next thing happens is then, um, then he collects, it says, chapter 47 says, he collected all the land of Egypt for the Pharaoh. And so people give up now they give up in their inheritance for their children. So now they know, don't have food. They don't have a way to get food. And now they don't have any land to grow food or they don't have any inheritance for their children to receive at all. And so this is what's happening under, under Joseph. And then it goes even one step further. One step worse, I will say. And that is that, that the people exchanged their freedom for food. They sold themselves into slavery. And so, so while, while Joseph was, was acting on behalf of the Pharaoh, still it's Joseph making these decisions. They were still his actions. And so here's what I think, is that it can happen, <coughs> pardon me, it can happen so quickly, and it can happen anywhere. Joseph, and, and Joseph actually, I think, placed both sides of the, of the street with his family. He's a good family man, but yet he's an empire man. He's, he's taking the, the, the food. He's, I mean, he's taking the money. He's taking the ability to make money. He's taking the ability to pass anything on to family. He's taking even their, the freedom of their lives themselves, and he's doing that. So it seemed like when I was reading through this, I just noticed this. I guess more especially this time than ever before, how Joseph is, is playing kind of a, I, I think, kind of a dangerous place here of taking away people's everything, even their freedom for food. But let's go on with verse, verse 48, or chapter 48, as what their scripture we're going to look at for the main part of this service today. Verse 48, or chapter 48 says, After this happened, that's all these things I've just talked about, all these things happened, Joseph was told, your father is getting weaker. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him. When Jacob was informed, your son Joseph is here now, he pulled himself together and sat up in bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me 
in Luz in the land of Canaan. He blessed me and said to me, I'm about to give you many children to increase your numbers and to make you a large group of peoples. I will give you this land to I will give this land to your descendants, following you as an as an enduring possession. Now your two sons born to you in the land of Egypt before uh, I arrived in Egypt are my own. Ephraim and Manasseh are just like Reuben and Simeon to me. Your, your family who is born to you after them are yours, but their inheritance will be determined under their brothers' names. When I came back from Padam Aram, Rachel died to my sorrow on the road in the land of Canaan with some distance yet to go to Ephrathah. So I buried her there near the road to Ephrathah, which is Bethlehem. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, who are these? Joseph said to his father, or told his father, they're my sons whom God gave me here. Israel said, bring them to me and I will bless them. Because Israel's eyesight had failed from old age and wasn't able to see. Joseph brought them close to him and he kissed and embraced them. Israel said to Joseph, I didn't expect I'd see your face, but now God has shown me your children too. Then Joseph took them from Israel's knees and he bowed low with his face to the ground. Joseph took both of them, Ephraim in his right hand and, and at Israel's left hand and Manasseh in his left hand at Israel's right hand and brought them close to him. But Israel put out his right hand and placed it on the head of Ephraim, the younger one, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, crossing his hands because Manasseh was the oldest son. He blessed them and said, May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, may the God who was my shepherd from the beginning until this day, may the divine messenger who protected me from all harm bless the young men. Through them may my name be kept alive and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. May they grow into a great multitude throughout the land. Then Joseph saw that his father had placed his right hand on Ephraim's head. He was upset and grasped his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to his father, No, my father, this is the eldest son. Put your right hand on his head. Remember, the right and the left hand had extreme importance. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He'll become a people too, but he, and he'll also be great. But his younger brother will be greater than he will, and his descendants will become many nations. Israel blessed them that day, saying, Through you, Israel will pronounce blessings, saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So Israel put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, I'm about to die. God will be with you and return you to the land of your fathers. I'm giving you one portion more than your brothers, a portion that I took from the Amorites with my sword and my bow. So Jacob, he claims Joseph's sons. So I don't know if you've ever noticed when you're looking at the, the 12 tribes of Israel, there's not a tribe of Joseph. Had you ever noticed that before? There's not a tribe of Joseph. There's a tribe of Ephraim and there's a tribe of Manasseh. Okay, so, so we don't have the, the tribe of Joseph. So that's uh, the, one of the things that we've noticed. But what's happening at this point is Jacob's family is, about, is beginning a 400 year stint of living as aliens in Egypt. At first, things are going very good for them. They have this promise that, that, uh, God's promise that they that he's given his family and this is a budding nation of of Israel now and and there's still this promised land that they can go to someday and what Israel does here is he makes Joseph promise that he'll bury that he makes Joseph promise that he'll take him back or that his descendants will take him back and bury him in Canaan in the promised land So when Jacob grew ill he takes his two sons to be blessed by their grandfather. This is the story we just read. 
And uh, I, I like the names of Joseph's sons. You know, of course, names back then were different than names today. They weren't just pretty names. They were names that were really saying something. So, so Manasseh means uh, God made me forget all my hardships. And so Joseph's first son, every time he mentions, says his son's name, his oldest son's name, what he's saying is, God, I'm so blessed. God made me forget anything that has gone wrong in my life. What a blessing. And then Ephraim the second, his name means God made me fruitful in the land of misfortunes. And so as he says the second son's name, he's reminded that God will use him and, and will continue his name through his sons. And, and so what's, one of the interesting things about Joseph's discussion with his grandsons and, and Joseph here is that he decides to talk about the blessing. He reminds them of, of the, the time in Luz that, that God spoke to him. He reminds them of, of Joseph's mom, of their grandmother, that died on the road there, on, there by Bethlehem. But you know, each new generation has to learn what the promise is, has to, has to learn what the promise means, and needs to live in the promise that God has given. And so this is something that Jacob is doing here. He's passing on the information of the promise so that they will know it, they will have it, so that they can live up to those promises or live in those promises, rather, that God has given them. And so Jacob calls his son, uh, the, his son to, to trust the promise and to trust only the promise. Because we have Joseph here who is who has control of everything in Egypt, and he has these two sons, it would be very easy to trust in what you can do and what you have done as the leader of Egypt. And, and here Israel is telling him to trust in the promise of God. It's greater than his um, place that he has in, in Egypt. So Israel, I think, it had lost hope that he would ever see Joseph again. We, we see that. He had grieved all that he could grieve. He had cried all the tears he could, he could cry. And, and so for him to get this unexpected blessing to see his son again, and, 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 and what a blessing. When he sees Joseph, he cries and he hugs him and, and holds on to him. And, and uh, then he finds out he also has grandsons. And we all know that if, if, we'd had, you know, if we knew how fun grandchildren were, we would have them first, right? We all, we all know that anyway. So, so he finds out he has these grandsons by, by Joseph and, and he, he loves these young men and he claims them as his own. Now, one of the, the, uh, the helps that I read, commentators talked about, about Jacob adopting the grandkids, adopting the two, his two grandkids as his own. I think the way we look at adoption today, it might be a little, uh, be a different adoption than that. But we do see that he takes them and gives them an inheritance equal to his own son's inheritance. And so here is this man's hope. Now it's hope again. He's been fulfilled again in his heart. Joseph is alive. He's reminded now that God has made a promise. And now his hope in the promise of God, stands alive and full and ready to be strong because there is Joseph in front of him. But here's the thing. With the hope that Jacob has, there's always been conflict. Have you recognized that? There's always this conflict. No, he's running for his life or, or he's uh, hiding behind some of the other people waiting for his brother to, to come down on him. There's always been conflict. Because he positioned himself to receive the blessing that he shouldn't have received as an older, as as his as the younger child, he, he should not have received. So he receives the bigger blessing, and that put him in conflict. But I want you to notice that isn't that the thing with this whole process? You know, you have Abraham and he his oldest son, Ishmael is supposed to receive the blessing, the prom primogenitor, and then he gives the blessing to Isaac, the younger son. And then Isaac is about to pass on the blessing to his 
older son, of the older of the twins, Esau, and he's about to pass him on, then they trick him and, he, and Jacob receives the blessing. And now Jacob is passing on the blessing not only to his own son, but his grandsons. He moves his hands, he, 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 he changes his hands, crosses his hands, and blesses the younger. And so, so it's interesting that, that every, and now in three generations, that this is the way it goes. And, and I would say that this about, about that, that, is that God ministers and moves in ways that we don't understand, in ways that we would not choose to have God move. Sometimes God moves in ways that we don't understand. He moves through people, uses people that we might not necessarily choose ourselves to use. God does things in ways that we say, whoa, I'm not sure about that, God. But yet God does that. And so it's a great reminder for us today that, that this is the way God works. God's way is different than ours. You know, uh, Joseph, the one son, gets a double portion through his, through his sons. Uh, he blesses, and, and he's a be a blessing of all people to all people. And yet, the Ephraim and Manasseh, Ephraim actually is the one of the, of the tribes that, that becomes the greatest. It becomes the greatest in number. Uh, have, have lots of, of children as they go. There's a thing to remember. Whatever, however God is moving, however God is changing things and moving in different directions and we thought God would move, God still is going to keep His promise. God will still be with us. God was still with Abraham. He was still with Isaac. He was still with Jacob or Israel. He's Now He's with Joseph and providing for the children. He will be with them as they move back to the promised land under the leadership of Moses and then Joshua. So as we look, as we've looked at this story for a moment, I, there's always a question I ask myself, whether it's in a sermon prep or if it's in daily Bible study. When I'm reading one of these stories that's of a different land, a different time, different set of economic situations, is what can I take from God's Word to guide my life? And so... Uh, that's what I want to talk about for just a couple of minutes to, to end this time. And then we're going to receive Holy Communion in just a few moments. But this part of, of God's, uh, this part of the story of God's faithfulness and, and, and Joseph's faithfulness actually too, gives us some great truths. So we have Jacob coming to his son and his grandson. So, so here's what I want to say is that as grandparents and parents, the generations, for, for those of us who are generations that are getting older, it is our responsibility to bless our children and our grandchildren. Now, now I've, seen, I've seen some families that curse the next generations. Maybe you've seen them too. And always just, it just hurts to see that because it becomes a downward spiral in those families. But it's our jobs to bless those who come behind us. God has blessed each one of us, and so we must pass on God's blessings to those who come behind us. Now, I would say it in these terms, to, to bless our children or grandchildren. Now, understand that has nothing to do with DNA. It, you know, if As we get older, and as our hair turns different color or turns loose, then we need to start thinking about who we're going to bless and how we're going to bless those who are coming behind us whether we have children or grandchildren or not, we need to find ways to bless the, the, the next generation. So that's one of the things I've, I, I see in this story and this whole series as we go, every time there's a blessing for the next generation, and that's a reminder that you, and you put your own name there, has a responsibility to bless those who are coming behind you. It's not just the pastor. It's not just the official grandparents or parents. But we all have a responsibility to provide a blessing, to give a blessing to those who come behind us. 
Another thing I, I, I see in this story, and, and especially in today's lesson, is that as the next generation, which, which we all have been, I mean, I mean, at one point all of us were the next young, brightest thing in the world, right? So as the next generation, we must hold on to the blessing. So if you're one of the younger people in here today, it's your job as you're blessed to hold on to that blessing, to hold on to know what it means to understand what it's about because at some point it's also going to be your job to pass that on to the next generation. So, so receiving the blessing is as important, is as important as giving the blessing. So, so if, if you're the younger generation today, as you are blessed by those ahead of you and older than you, Hold on to that. Remember what that is. Maybe you need to write that down. Maybe it's a good time to journal. Let's write those things down because those blessings are an important part of our lives. Always have been. And here's, here's the thing. See, God, God's work does not begin with me. God's work does not end with me. God's work in me is for more than just me. Way too many me's there, Right? I'm going to say it again because I think it's important for us to remember we're part of East Cross today, but East Cross didn't begin the day you started. Right? God has been working before you and before me. God is working through you and me. And God also will continue to work after you and me are not no longer a part. And so we're a part of the process. We're part of that receiving blessings and passing the blessing. God's work does not begin with me, nor does it end with me. And God's work in me is for more than just me. It's for those, for others who, some who desperately need God's blessing. Let me add one more thing that I, I saw in, in verse or chapter 47, leading up to the scripture that we read today. And that's this, Joseph took everything from the people. By the time he got to, he took everything they had. He took, he took their livestock. He took their, their land. He took their freedom. He took everything to give them food for, to eat. Now, that's not the only time that's happened in the history of the world. You realize that, right? And so here, I think, is our responsibilities as followers of Jesus Christ. I believe that we desperately need to pray for our elected officials of this great nation. And I think we need to pray for all people who have power over other human beings. That they would seek God's will and God's wisdom as they direct and lead. I think we need to pray for people who are under oppressive regimes. I think we need to pray for the 25 million people or so today that are that live as, in, as slaves. They're, they're enslaved people. Slavery didn't end with the Civil War. Slavery is going on all over our world right now. It has nothing to do with color skin. Sometimes it has to do with your gender. Sometimes it has to do with other things. But here's the thing. There are people enslaved that people in power are enslaving. And I... And I you know, I just almost dis really. I guess I'm disappointed that Joseph did that. I don't know what else he would do, but I, I, in reading it over again, I'm just thinking, man, I'm disappointed that people had to give up the, everything, including their freedom, for some food. But it's a reminder for us today to pray for others that are enslaved, for those who are oppressed in our world, because there are those, and a bunch, millions, millions of people, millions. And I want to close with this idea. Uh, I, I got this list from, from Elmer Towns, uh, who, who is an instructor at, at Liberty University. Had a couple of classes under him. But here's, here's what, how do you bless children? I, I said there that we, needed to bless, we need to bless our children. We need to bless our families. And so how do we bless our children? What does that look like? What do you say? What do you do? And so he gave five steps of blessing, how to bless children. And let me just share those with you. 
Uh, so if you may want to know. He says that number one is, to, is a, a blessing a child or blessing children is a healthy, meaningful touch. So we all know that there are such things as unhealthy touches, but this is a healthy, meaningful touch. And the way I picture that is maybe putting your hands over theirs or under theirs or taking their shoulders and, and making sure you have eye contact and, and uh, bless a child with a meaningful, healthy touch. That's the first thing you do. Second thing is bless with spoken word. Words have the power of life and death in them. You can say a word that will, that will mortally wound a child. You can also say things that will give them the strength to put up with almost anything in, in this world. And so, use the blessing time to give a spoken word. Sometimes, a child will know that they are loved by you no matter what happens. And that you have every faith and trust in them. Sometimes that's the main thing they need. Step three by Elmer Towns is to attach high value. So if, if you're going to bless a child, be sure that they have value to you. If it's a child or grandchild, make sure that you're investing in them, that they have value enough that you will share with them in your blessing what it will take to keep that going. Picture, or number four uh, he says is to picture a special future for the one being blessed. I think if we'll take time to pray for the child or the children that we're going to bless, if we'll take time to do that, then, then God, I think, often gives us a picture of what, maybe not exactly, but some kind of a picture of, of them in the future. And, and so, maybe have a special picture of the one being blessed. A picture a special future for them. And then the fifth thing, the last thing he adds here is this, is an active commitment to fulfilling the blessing. Okay, I like that part the best. So if we're going to bless children, it's not just about saying some pretty words and going on about your life. For Jacob, blessing these two grandsons, it was about saying the words and then giving them equal shares of what was going of what he was to give to all of his children. If we're going to bless a child or to bless children, then we need to have an active commitment in fulfilling the blessing. We're not done when we say whatever it is we say over that child. We need to invest in those children. We need to invest our time Maybe it's money we need to invest. Whatever it is. If, if we have a, a blessing for them, maybe it's part of investing in their college. Whatever it might be, however it is that we might need to do it, we must invest. Elmer says, if we're going to bless them, we have to be involved with them from that day forward. The blessing is the beginning, not the ending. Okay? Jacob blessed his grandsons in his old age. Have you ever been blessed by somebody? It's one of the greatest gifts to have a blessing from somebody. I take those extremely serious. I think Scripture shows it to be one of the highest honors is to be blessed by somebody else. I invite you, if you've been blessed, to remember that. I invite you, if you have no others that are younger than you that have value, I, honor, I invite you to bless them and invest in their lives. Would you pray with me?